in my opinion, wellness is not a state. Wellness is not a noun. It should be a verb. I am here today with Dr. Victor Nazarian. Uh, you are the founder of Integrated Health Solutions, and this is a center for regenerative medicine and longevity. And so the first question I want to dive into what brought you into this field, because we were talking before we started filming and anyone who is outside of the tradition Western medical track has a story. There's a reason that we said, no, this integrative approach is very important. We want to hear the patient's story. We want to get to know what's going on. There's a reason that we implemented things into our practices in such a way. So I know you were originally trained as a chiropractor, but even getting into chiropractic, there's a story there, right? Yes. So what made you open this incredible practice? What was your journey to get here? Well, I'll try to make it short. It's a long story. <laughs> um, uh, it all started, uh, I was 15 and I had a brain tumor, I found out. And uh, um, I had a couple surgeries, had that, uh, uh, removed it was benign um, and after that though I still had headaches I had headaches for years following that and it would not it was a daily thing uh, I remember being I was around 18 or 19 I was in college and if I was walking down the hallway you could hear me coming down the hall because I had a bottle of Tylenol in my backpack and as I would walk you'd hear the rattle of the pills and that's how I lived. I had headaches, I had neck pain, I had problems that I wish I didn't have. And uh, I went, I had a neurologist, I was going to physical therapy, I was, uh, I had my uh, family physician. Um, I was seeing multiple people and couldn't really get a, a, a handle on what was going on. And uh, one and people would tell me go see a chiropractor. And I thought, oh, well, I don't want to see a chiropractor. I, um, uh, um, I've, I have a neurologist. I, I have uh, uh, the talk doctor at such and such hospital, and so um, I didn't go. But my problem still continued. So uh, one day I asked the physical therapist that I was going to, and I and, he, and I said, um, uh, you know, what do you think about me seeing a chiropractor? I keep people keep telling me I should see see one, and what do you think? And he said, well, you know. You're doing so well here. Why do you need to see a chiropractor? And mm. I was thinking, well, I'm not really doing well. And I, and 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 he said, well, and and you know maybe the chiropractor will will, will hurt you, or you may have a, a worse problem if you go. So I don't think you should go. And then I, I remember I was 19, and I was thinking to myself, but that doesn't make sense because. You're saying I'm getting better, but I'm not getting better. I feel as light as a feather when I leave the office, but by the time I make it back to the library to go study, my neck is stiff and uh, temporarily functional. Correct. Versus optimal solving. Correct. Problem. At that point, that's what actually made me go see a chiropractor. But otherwise, I probably wouldn't have seen one. Mm -hmm. So I went to the chiropractor. The, uh, this this doctor, he took X-rays of me. It was the first doctor who actually showed me my X-rays after all the things that I've been through. It was the first one. Show me the x-rays and show me exactly what my problem was. I thought, oh, wow, no one showed me that to me. And after two weeks of seeing him, my headaches were gone. And I felt amazing. I felt what a 19-year-old should feel. Yeah. And uh, at that point, I was like, well, I want to know what this is. Mm -hmm. Back before that, I was in pre-med. I wanted to be a medical doctor. And nothing wrong with being a medical doctor. Absolutely not. Uh, but... At that point, I, th I thought, I want to know what this is. Yeah. And so um, the rest is history. I went on to chiropractic college, became a chiropractor. And uh, over the years, I treated patients. And something that was a challenge for me is that seeing patients reach that point of no return, where they have arthritic changes now. They have arthritis in their spine. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they had seen me or someone like me years before uh, to maintain their mechanics, biomechanics, and, and making sure that those, those joints are moving properly and not, not lined up improperly or, or the posture was improved, they wouldn't, ha they wouldn't be in my office sitting there with arthritis. And the thing was, as a chiropractor, I could not do anything about their arthritis other than to manage them. Mm -hmm. My method is without medication, so I can, I can do 
plenty to make that patient feel better despite they're not taking medications and despite the fact that they have arthritis. But I got tired of that. And I thought, I thought there's got to be another way. So um, I started researching and I found that the use of stem cells is growing. And I, I, I read the research. I mean, it's there. It, it, it's so evident the ability to regenerate tissue and they've been they've been doing this since the since 1913 when they put an umbilical cord on burn victims and saw their skin regenerate right before their eyes and so this has been going on for a very long time and only athletes high-end uh people who who really have you know uh, the connection so to speak yeah looking for the ultimate recovery have the means to do that yeah have the research in their back pocket that's right not your general consumer not the general consumer not yeah. the general person and so regular people were not were not getting this as much and so until the last handful of years now it's becoming more and more mainstream uh it went from being something that was experimental to cutting edge and now it's getting even more mainstream and so uh um, at that point i thought this is it this is what's going to help people regenerate and so i i thought of you know i i do functional medicine i do so many different things with patients uh, holistically diet wise etc this would be amazing. This would help people so much. And so we, we integrated the office. And so now we have, uh, we, we have holistic and medical together. And on the medical side is the regenerative side. And on the holistic side, the chiropractic side, we, we do the rehab. And so on one end, we're dealing with the biomechanics. And on the other end, for those people who have damage, there's the regenerative medicine. So you yeah. kind of filled in the whole spectrum. You know, you started on more the preventative side, the lifestyle side. You know, you saw the power of chiropractic care and the ability to reverse certain things like, you know, your experience with the headaches. But then to then see that need that, wait, but what about the people who are past that point who yeah. still need help? And they deserve more help than just here is your medication. Let's manage the symptoms. And now you're kind of, you know bringing those things closer together by creating the integrated office. That's, so. that's how I feel we are doing it. And we hope that we can help as many people as possible. And we're seeing more of this in medicine, which is a great thing because we're Absolutely. in the age of chronic conditions. People need help. There are so many, like you said, it's just the chronic conditions that are out there. Uh, there's so many degenerative issues happening, everything from joints to brain. The brain is degenerating for everyone with that who is involved in, uh, in, in a toxic world where they're, they're breathing, they're drinking or eating foods that are not good for them, creating inflammation in the, in the body. So these are, this is why nowadays we're hearing more and more about Alzheimer's or yeah. Parkinson's, uh, things that we didn't hear too much about 20 years ago. Now you hear it a lot, mm -hmm. uh, as much as you hear about joint degeneration or arthritis. This is, it's not an accident, they are both they're coming hand in hand because of where we are as a society with healthcare right. and also with diet yep. and what's going on around us in our environment. So things have to change and it has to start with our ability as doctors to educate our patients. Absolutely. If we can educate people to say, listen, this is that thing you're going to put in your mouth, that's going to create inflammation. That inflammation is the starting point of disease, whether it's in the joint or in an organ system. So. And always addressing the source. Always. Yeah. And I think also trying to move away from the idea of, oh, this is scary to know all this information. No, it's empowering to know all this information. Because yeah. if you know this, like you said, if you know what I know, you can do something about it. Absolutely. And how incredible is that? That's amazing. <laughs> do you find that education is a huge part of that? Are these a lot of therapies that patients might not be familiar with? Do you get the patient who comes in, they're like, I don't know, I've seen 15 different people and... I still don't feel well. What can you do for me? We see a lot of that. Yeah. Nowadays, um, it's very important to, to be able to talk to patients mm -hmm. and not only understand what they're saying and understand what their condition, but why it hasn't worked for them, whatever treatments they've received in the past. And once you figure out what's wrong and what the actual problem is, and if you understand the physiology of what's 
what's behind their issue, then it's important to, for the patient to know what you know. If a patient knows what I know, then them knowing what to do is very simple. Then it's empowering. It is. For them, it's an amazing thing to be able to finally have a grasp on what's wrong and what am I going to do about it. Yeah. And so um, for many, it's liberating. They, they, mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at the time when I go over a treatment plan, at the end of it, they're happy. They have a big smile on their face. They're thinking that, knowing that I know what's wrong. I'm going to fix this and this is how I'm going to go about it. Not being told, well, let's see what happens. Let's, let's wait six months and see what happens. Right. All that's going to happen is that they're just going to get worse. Mm -hmm. The condition will get worse. Their symptoms may stabilize, but that's human nature. That's the physiology. The symptom will go down, yet the condition is getting worse. It's degenerating. And so we can't base it on how good we feel. We have to base it on the function mm -hmm. of the body. Well, we're highly adaptive as human beings. And I think people don't realize that. We reach like a new level of normal in not feeling well and then patients get used to that and they just think oh it, it's normal to wake up every morning and be exhausted or it's normal to you know get to the middle of the day and feel like my head is spinning or oh well of course i have three kids like no wonder i'm stressed but the debilitating effect that those conditions have even if we are very adaptive as humans and can be able to get through that we still have to treat the root of what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very important. Uh, the body has the ability to adapt. The body heals. However, if there is a mechanical issue or if there is something going on in the body, the body will adapt. It will compensate. As it compensates, the symptoms go down. They feel better. Right. And just because they feel better doesn't mean that, okay, well, then you're done. You're good. Yeah. Here, take this pill. You don't get headaches anymore. Isn't that great? But no, what caused a headache? Or what caused their blood pressure to rise? Or what caused their digestive issue? That's the issue. And so, in my opinion, wellness is not a state. Wellness is not a noun. It should be a verb. You have to do wellness. You have to actively do things to create that state, status of well-being. And so... As a verb, when you, when you treat it as a verb, that means that you actively do things to be healthy all the time. You don't wait until the symptom rises. If the symptom comes and goes, that's just a warning. Warning saying, hey, you right. need to do something. Don't sit around. But most people will either just wait or take some sort of medication that will suffocate that symptom. But Same the thing with pain. And you work a lot with pain, right? With the we work a lot with pain too. It's a signal. I always have it to is. tell patients, you know, pain is not the enemy. We don't like it. It's uncomfortable, yes. but it's telling us that something's wrong. That's it's true. It's a signal, just like any other symptom that's going on in your body. And if we're not looking at well, what's causing the pain and we're just masking it, like you said, the condition will continue to get worse. Absolutely. So can you talk a little bit about the regenerative therapies that you do. I know you specifically developed um, restorative joint rehab. R restorative joint rehab. Okay. Um, with that's uh, what we do on a rehab basis. Uh, the rehab that we do in the office, uh, it's something that I developed over 25 years of practice where it's not just to reduce their pain, but it's actually to correct the mechanic the biomechanical flaw that's going on biomechanically if if there's three th it really comes down to three things that cause accelerated wear and tear of a joint mm -hmm. and that's what causes what's called osteoarthritis mm -hmm. so these three things it com comes down to when the joint is misaligned when the joint doesn't move properly or there's undue compression onto the joint due to poor posture these three things result in osteoarthritis. So on the rehab end of it, it's a matter of preventing and or correcting the biomechanical flaw. Mm -hmm. But for those people who didn't do that, not just in our office, but in life in general, they just didn't correct the biomechanical flaw, that results in accelerated wear and tear or degenerative joint disease, mm -hmm. whether it's in a knee, hip, spine, shoulder, etc. 
for those people where the joint has broken down already, before there was no other thing for them to do. It was either opioids or other pain medications or pain management, uh, steroids or joint replacement. Now there's regenerative medicine. There's things like uh, mesenchymal stem cells. There are things such as a PRP and prolotherapy. Um, specifically with stem, uh, stem cells, it gives the body the potential to regenerate tissue. Which is amazing. Which is amazing. Amazing. It is absolutely Because the body wants to heal. To give it that ability, it's incredible. The body has the ability to heal. It, it heal anything. If you have surgery, yes, the whatever was wrong, the tumor, etc., was removed, but it's the body that heals mm -hmm. post surgery. Right. If you have a cold, the cold, you take you take medications or you take vitamins or herbs, but ultimately you're helping your body do the work. Your body is doing all the work. So when it comes to regenerative medicine uh, with stem cells, you're increasing the body's ability to heal because you're putting in cells. These are human cells that are given, that are injected to actually help the body regenerate tissue. The use of stem cells, it's not condition specific. We're used to condition specific. If you have a, a heart ailment, here's a medication to, for that. If you have a stomach issue, here's a medication for that. Stem cell use is not like that. Stem cells are not condition specific. They are physiology specific. Mm -hmm. And so, the use of stem cells is that if you give a stem cell, you put it into a knee joint, the potential is there for it to increase or regenerate cartilage if that's what is missing or that is what is damaged in the joint. So it increases the ability for the body to replicate or regenerate tissue, to regenerate blood vessels, so increasing blood circulation. And also, as a result of that, it reduces inflammation because now the joint is healthier, so inflammation reduces. And, also, and actually, there are, uh, there's evidence that it helps to uh, uh, repair the immune system, depending on how the delivery form uh, uh, of the injection. It's like a highly technical adaptogen. Yes. However, it's, it, it, it follows what you... The instructions that it is given once it is injected into the patient and so the stem cells actually communicate with your healthy cells through receptor sites and they are told listen we have a car we have a cartilage problem in the knee we need cartilage so these stem cells that have no instructions yet they switch and they switch into cartilage cells and so um, it's a beautiful thing when we see a patient who uh, they have a knee that is literally just about bone on bone and months later uh, that x-ray looks different mm -hmm. uh, or even months before that they're already improving they're walking around they're running they're more active uh, same goes with the spine patient patients for example with stenosis uh, so uh, we see a lot of that and so um, I myself I, I used to have 25 migraines a month, wow. which was unheard of. But once I got stem cells, um, little by little, it, they reduced. And after a handful of months, since then, I haven't had a migraine. I, the last one I had was maybe six weeks ago, and it was mild. It's just, it increases the body's ability to heal. Is the body is what heals. The body heals itself. Mm -hmm. The use of stem cells allows for that to happen in a more efficient way. Well, and also with that being highly customized to each individual, I always tell people the more uh, technical and advanced the science, the more of a specialist you want. So how do you decide and how, how do patients know if they're a candidate for this type of therapy? How do you as a practitioner decide, okay, you know, stem cells would be a great fit for you. Oh, you know, we're going to go this, we're going to do prolotherapy. How, what are things people need to take away from this to, you know, come and see you or another incredible practitioner that this could be something life altering for them? Right. You no, know, um, 
the way we, the way we do it in our office is that the patient will come in and we will actually do uh, the nurse practitioner will see the patient i will see the patient i'm not the one who does the uh, injections themselves uh, the regenerative uh, medicine uh, portion is handled by the nurse practitioner and the md who supervises however as in our office we collaborate and so as we collaborate, we, we look at the joint, we look at the, the, the lifestyle the patient has, the overall health uh, history of the patient, and the lifestyle that they have and what they do as far as exercise or work, et cetera. And so that helps us understand if they are a candidate, especially the amount of joint damage that's present. Um, and anyone will improve or have some sort of uh, gain with stem cells. But we're not just looking to have gains or improvements. We want to we want to knock the ball out of the park. We want Optimize. extraordinary change, not just functional. That's optimal. right. We right. want optimal with them. And so uh, uh, what happens is that basically we once we've checked everything on them, we also have to take into consideration what the patient wants and what their goals are. If they just want improvements and they want to feel better, maybe they maybe stem cells is not for them. Maybe then PRP would be a better thing for them. Maybe uh, prolotherapy. Uh, sometimes we use those in combination with stem cells. It depends on the condition and the severity. If it's a uh, patient with a lumbar issue, then uh, that might be something that stem cells would be that would work best. If it's a knee, uh, any one of the three would be a benefit. But if we're talking about regenerating tissue, uh, stem cells have the potential to do that. Uh, not so much with PRP or Prolo. Yeah. So, and my takeaway from that, and this is something that, you know, anyone on a practitioner level that I network with, that I refer patients to, the importance of that customized approach. Because and you mentioned uh, a minute ago that, you know, you have to look at the person's lifestyle. What are they currently doing? How is that therapy going to fit into their lifestyle? And I think that's where the functional medicine buzzword comes in, because someone could come in with the exact same diagnosis. Yes. And the implementation of a proper treatment plan is going to be very different because Absolutely. of their lifestyle and what kind of success they're going to have. And that's also where the patient empowerment part comes in too. Yes. Because if you as a practitioner, you know, you mentioned the importance of, you know, sitting down and really getting to know a patient. If you take that time really getting to know the patient and see what's going to fit into their lifestyle, it can be very empowering for them because it's going to be a treatment plan that they can look at and say, I can do this. This isn't something that makes no sense for my exactly. life. I understand how I got to this point, and now I have a little bit of a roadmap, you know, of how to get me out of here. And people might have the same destination, but roadmap is going to be a little bit different for how to get there. I agree. It just depends on what they need in their life and what does optimal look like for them. If you do not, if you can incorporate a full. Uh, uh, structure of knowing what's going on with the patient not just while they're sitting there in your office but also knowing their 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 lifestyle and everything from their diet to how they exercise how they live how they they, they work uh, understanding fully their condition that is optimal anything less than that and you're just experimenting you're hoping that what you've done in the past with other patients that sound similar is going to work and not everyone is the same. We've all heard that before. Yeah. Well, here is a perfect example of why you can't do the same thing with different people. Absolutely. So, so any last words for our listeners? Words of empowerment or <laughs> wisdom? Well. Like, no. <laughs> there is. Um, I know there's so much we could both say. But <laughs> I guess there is. I would say that um, there's a few things I would tell, uh, if I would say something, I would say that everyone should be stretching. Mm -hmm. Everyone should stretch. Everyone should stretch their muscles for the rest of their lives. Okay. You brush your teeth for the rest of your life. Does that mean you have a tooth problem? No. It's preventative. It's to prevent. Movement. And movement is your friend. Movement is always your friend. So yoga stretching is okay. It's great. 
However, I'm talking about stretching your legs, your arms, your chest, the long muscles. That's what's going to increase blood circulation. That's what maintains muscular flexibility. And that puts movement into the body and blood flow. So, and, and along with that, drink water. The formula I like to use with my patients is 80% of your body weight in ounces. If you drink 80% of your body weight in ounces, at that point, you are feeding enough water to your body to give fluids to your bloodstream, your organs, and your muscles so that your organs do not have to steal water from your muscles, joints, and skin. So those would be the, the two huge things I would say that those are two active things that you can do to make an impact on your overall health. I like acupuncture a lot for patients. I think that it's what it helps to do is that it helps to stimulate the nerves that go to organs from the from its origin at the at the spine mm -hmm. all the way to the end at its target site yeah. so with with acupuncture you have the ability to stimulate nerves that are not they're not awake so to speak whether it's due to toxicity in the body, whether it's due to the blood flow being altered to the nerve. And so uh, it's just that acupuncture is a wonderful uh, modality to use to maintain the overall health. It's just another thing when I said earlier about doing wellness. Wellness is a verb. Acupuncture must be involved in that. Because with acupuncture, you are able to actually address things that the patient does not know. They don't know that they may have a liver issue. They may find out if they did a blood test, but even on a simple blood test, they, might, they may still not know. Right. However, uh, if an acupuncturist knows or finds that, well, there's, there's something stagnant here, or there's something not functioning well here, and they are actually going to go ahead and address whatever it is that they find and stimulate the nerve that goes to the liver, then that's something, something where that you are doing actively. You are doing wellness. And so um, uh, I refer to uh, acupuncturists all the time. We don't have one in our office. We don't have the space for it. But, uh, but otherwise, we probably would. But that's part of the integrative care model, too. Like it knowing is. practitioner, we can't do everything in one you house. Cannot. There's only so much space here in L.A. So mm. you need to know the best people to refer you, to. And you have to. be able to create that care network for your patients. You do. In, so. in order to maintain... Uh, uh, the ability to help your patients on every level, you have to understand what you can do and what you cannot do. Mm -hmm. But knowing what they need, then you can send them to a practitioner who can give them what they need. So whether it's sending them to an acupuncturist or sending them to uh, Reiki or whether it's to send them to uh, another uh, integrated office that can do something different, um, you have to be open to that. It I think can't. the openness is important. It is. It because we also, you know, need to be humble to know we also don't know what we don't know. You know, I know stem cells are great, but I'm not going to be able to say like, oh, you know, this person would be a better fit than this person. Like, I send them to you for that. <laughs> so um, having that humility, and I think that adds a lot as a practitioner, and it adds to the patient experience and the patient's confidence level in you for you to be able to say, you know, I know someone who can do even more with this than I can, That's who's true. gonna be part of our team and can help you with Absolutely. this. Absolutely. My, my principle I go be with is, I gotta do whatever I can for the best of the patient. If you have that mindset, I feel, everything takes care of itself. Absolutely. So if my mindset is, uh, I have to do whatever I can for the best of this patient, if it means that I have to, uh, have our nurse practitioners see them instead of me, uh, uh, refer them out to a different office, uh, whether it's acupuncture or physical therapy, whatever it, it is best for the patient. Mm -hmm. If you think about what's best for the patient, you can never go wrong. Yeah, I heard something, and then we'll wrap up, that often uh, people in that dynamic fail because they don't realize that as the practitioner, you're just the guide. The patient is the hero of the story. It's not about you being the hero as the practitioner. 
you're supposed to be there to help guide them, but they should be the hero of their own story. They should reap the benefits from it, and it should be about them and what's best for them. So however we can fit into that, that's wonderful. But if, you know, how we fit into it is, I know this other great person. Um, And it also expands awareness for the different opportunities that are evolving within healthcare now. Um, And hopefully it'll keep patients optimistic. You know, don't lose hope. There's so many chronic conditions. People are so sick. They're so sad. They're so frustrated. But there are doctors out there who are looking to put those puzzle pieces together and you know help you get better. So. Absolutely, I agree. Well, thank you so much for coming. Of course, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you.